Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar on tra travel tips with multiple sclerosis. My name is Ann Lee and I'm the Senior Specialist of Programs and Online Education for Can Do Multiple Sclerosis and I'll be your moderator this evening. For most of you, uh, you already know who we are and what we do, for, but for those of you who are new to us, um, Can Do MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people that live with MS and their support partners. We educate and empower people to move beyond their MS by giving them some knowledge and skills and confidence to uh, adopt some healthy lifestyle behaviors, and we do that through the different programs that we offer to the people living with MS. And so here on your screen, you can see some of the programs that we do offer. We have our monthly webinars, um, and all of our webinars are recorded and archived on our website. So please feel free to visit our website and view any of the webinars that we have posted in the last two or three years. And we also have our in-person programs. We have our big flagship uh, CanDo program. That's a four-day uh, program that's held in Denver. We have our one-day jumpstart programs that are held in different cities around the country. And we also have our two-and-a-half-day Take Charge program. So again, if you visit our website, then you can learn about all these programs and see if we're coming to a town near you. We are also on social media, so please look for us on Facebook on Pinterest, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and connect with us. You can learn about all kinds of up-to-date information on our events or our programs uh, just by visiting these sites. Um, and we're also on YouTube where you can also find more archived webinars and some fun, fun video clips that can -Do MS has produced. So throughout this webinar, um, you will be able to chat any questions that you might have to me. Uh, you can do so um, in the chat feature that's located on the left-hand bottom side of your screen. So if you have questions, feel free to uh, chat them over to me and, and type them in, and we will save them for the last 10 minutes of our webinar this evening, and I will be able to uh, present your questions to our speakers. Um, please keep in mind that uh, this webinar is being recorded, so all of the lines have been muted. Um, and the presentation is recorded and will be archived on our website. So if you do need to click off early, no worries. You can just visit our website and uh, finish listening to the webinar tomorrow. And before we get started, I do want to introduce our presenters for this evening's webinar. Uh, we have Julianne hansen Zlatov, an occupational therapist for 23 years, 20 of which she has specialized in neurological rehabilitation. Throughout her career, she has sought positions with multidisciplinary healthcare teams, including MS Rehabilitation Clinic, Spasticity Clinic, Huntington's Disease Clinic, Epilepsy, and Brain Tumor Medical Teams. Julianne has performed research in motor recovery from stroke while working with Colorado Neurological Institute in association with the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. She has worked at the Rocky Mountain MS Center teaching numerous classes and seminars regarding MS symptom management. It was a natural fit for Julianne to join Can Do MS as an occupational therapist consultant 10 years ago, and she loves the positive energy the programs provide. Julianne has specialized in outpatient therapy for 15 years and now owns her own clinic, Red Willow LLC, located in Castle Rock, Colorado. Her special interest is restoring quality of movement while maximizing independence and wellness in daily activities. This has led her to study myofascial release as a unique and holistic treatment option for many individuals, and this has provided an exciting way to treat both body and mind for a transformative experience. Welcome, Julianne. And we also have Mandy Rorig, who is a physical therapist, uh, and she graduated from Nebraska Wesleyan University with a Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Science and a minor in Spanish. Following her undergraduate education, Mandy received her Doctorate of Physical Therapy from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. She is a member of the American Physical Therapy Association's Neurological Section. Mandy is employed at Horizon Rehabilitation Centers, an outpatient physical therapy clinic where she specializes in the rehabilitation of individuals with neurological conditions, with a special emphasis in the treatment of individuals with MS, as well as balanced vestibular disorders. She is actively involved in the MS community in Omaha, regularly consulting and collaborating with local MS professionals, exercise organizations, and support groups. Nationally, she is currently serving on a committee for the National MS Society's Professional Resource Center and as a member of the National MS Society's Content Advisory Team. Mandy has served as a staff member for Can Do MS 
uh, since 2007. And so now I'd like to welcome uh, Mandy and Julianne. Um, and please feel free to take it away. All right, Julianne, evening, this is Mandy Rorig. Um, Julianne and I will be having a conversation with one another as well as with all of you regarding um, trains, planes, and automobiles, the tips and tricks for traveling with multiple sclerosis. So when you hear my voice, this is Mandy, and then I'll uh, like to introduce you to Julianne. <laughs> Thank you very much. And this is Julianne. And uh, we'll be talking, um, as Mandy said, we'll be having a conversation. So I'm ready for the next slide. So probably many of you have seen the iconic movie uh, Trains, Planes, and Automobiles with John Candy and Steve Martin. And probably um, not in its entirety, but we can all relate to some of the aspects of the horrible time that they had in the movie. But it's a great movie and very fun. And for us, we, it underscores the, uh, the, the, the good decisions that you can make by choosing your travel companions and choosing your modes of travel also wisely. That helps you to enjoy the adventure. So next slide. Yeah. So many people um, end up wondering whether or not it's worth it to travel. That the, do the advantages of travel outweigh the barriers, particularly some of the barriers that, that come with MS symptoms? Do those limit the joy of travel for you? We're hoping tonight that through the webinar we can help you tip the scale by doing some problem solving together, by providing some solutions that, that we have come up with over the years. Um, and to help eliminate or, or decrease some of the barriers that are related to MS and travel. So unless you're one of those people, and there are those out there, that really love spontaneity and, and just responding to the moment, um, planning is usually our best way to overcome um, any barriers that might come up um, down the road, if you'll pardon the pun. In MS, there really is enough uncertainty with some of our symptoms that it's important to be able to plan and prepare, and that gives us a little bit more uh, control. We have a bit of a plan that, that, that leads to greater success in traveling. So having a good plan and pre uh, preparing for it and prioritizing with it will lead us to our best success. So Julianne, how do you know where your road will take you? Well, that's about as individual as, as all the people that are listening to this webinar right now. Some of the things that might help guide your decisions would be quite simply what your interests are. Excuse me. <clears throat> what your interests are and, and what are your hobbies. Um, are you traveling because you want to relax um, by the seaside? Is going to the mountains relaxing for you? Maybe you're one of those people that enjoys an educational um, vacation or you just love adventure. Or maybe it's time to go and visit family and friends and, and see their homes and, and see the places that they have been wanting you to see. One of the other factors that you want to consider is weather. And you want to consider about the time of year that you're going to go and visit a place and what, what, the, what the general trends are. So in terms of, say, hot weather and managing heat with MS, Alaska might be a great place to visit in the summer, and Florida might be a great place to visit in the wintertime. But one of the things that we also recommend is starting out and problem solving over a shorter period of time and then increasing the duration of your vacation. So maybe starting with a long weekend or even a weekend trip just to see how, your, how the activities of, of travel, how travel um, works on your fatigue level, um, to see how pacing goes, um, to see how, what kinds of problems kind of crop up for you. Um, you may decide at that point that you might want to use a walker or a scooter or a wheelchair because that helps you to conserve your energy. It helps you to plan ahead to know when might be a good time and where might be a good place to sit down and, and take a rest break. So starting small and working up is always a, a good idea. So Julianne, if you're undecided, how do you know where to go? What are some resources? Well, there's quite a few resources out there, not the least of which are just sitting down and chatting with a travel agent who has knowledge about accessibility. Um, they can be a limitless resource and, and can come up with suggestions that you may have never thought of before. And there are two good books here that we have listed. 
Fodor's Great American Vacations for Travelers with Disabilities, and Barrier Free Travel by Candy Harrington. Great, thanks. And then some additional references that you can find online that I'm aware of are listed on this slide, ActiveMSers, DisabledTravelersGuide.com, etc. And of course using the National MS Society is also a great resource. So Absolutely. Julianne, what, what should, else do you, should you think about when you are deciding to pack? Well, we can have a suitcase that looks like the one on the left, or you can have one that looks like on the right. And one of the things that you want to, there, there are several factors that you want to take into to consideration. And when personal needs, accessibility, medications, and mobility are kind of a, a, in a nutshell there. But personal needs um, can extend beyond um, just like what you need for getting dressed or taking a shower, things like that. It, it can also include how you react as an individual to things that happen. So what are you like when you get hungry? Um, what do you like when you get tired? Um, who are you traveling with? Are you traveling with small children? Are you traveling with someone who's older? Those, those personal needs are also something that you want to take into consideration and plan for. But personal needs, um, in a, big, a big part of this is fatigue management. And what I encourage is bringing along the tools and utensils that can minimize your fatigue as much as possible. So that might be um, considering taking a, a walker or a wheelchair or maybe a travel chair. Um, it can mean taking a reacher or a leg lifter, so anything that makes everyday activities a little bit easier and, and maximize your independence. So in terms of a hotel room, as you, as you develop your plan for where you want to go and, and where you want to stay, we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's always a good idea to call ahead to hotels if you need an accessible room. And the reason for that is that it's actually rather surprising what some hotels consider an accessible room. Um, it's a great idea to know pretty much what you want, exactly what you want, and, and query them about that because some hotels will think that you know, maybe just a bigger size room is sufficient. Um, when, when really you need to find out about um, the doorway to the bathroom and whether or not they have safety bars in the shower and whether or not they have a refrigerator. One of the, another good idea that you might want to, to bring past your occupational therapist is working on transfers in smaller places. If, if you use a, a wheelchair predominantly to get around, um, learning how to do transfers in a, in a very flexible way, left side and right side and, and in small spaces, can really increase your confidence when you are uh, in a hotel room. So Julianne, we all know that a routine can be significantly interrupted when we're traveling. So what should right. you consider about traveling and taking medications, things like that? Right, and, and who of us has not been on a vacation where it, the traveling has been interrupted by quite a bit? <laughs> so medications sometimes require um, the need, require to be refrigerated. Um, so you want to make sure that you are either traveling with a pack, a cool pack that will keep it cool, um, or find out whether or not there are refrigerators um, available in the hotel rooms. But other things to consider are how medication impacts you. So for instance, if you take your medication and, and you, um, like say one of the injectables, and you're pretty tired or you have flu-like symptoms afterward for a day, that might be something to consider. You might want to take, uh, take it easy on that day of travel um, and maybe not schedule as many things to do. And you want to take, so taking time before or after, and knowing how it impacts your energy level can really help you plan. And then hydration, which is always a, a big deal. A lot of times we're, it's recommended that we take more fluids with our medications. And then whenever you're traveling, for some reason it's incredibly dehydrating. So we always need to drink more. So I came across a really great rule of thumb here recently. Um, my son, Scoutmaster, he was at camp last week, um, gave us the rule of the 4x4. Four four. If you drink four Nalgene bottles of, of water by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that's pretty good. So it's a kind of a nice little mnemonic to remember how much to hydrate. So 
Julianne, are there any other personal needs we should consider when we're packing? Oh, definitely. Um, we need to um, think about one of the major things I would, I would recommend as an occupational therapist is to say, save your energy in, in the scheme of the whole day for all the fun things that you're going to do. Um, so that means if, if you have to bring along a little bit of durable medical equipment to make, say, buttoning easier, so bringing the button hook or, or a shoehorn or uh, the reacher, a bath chair, if, anything that, that shaves energy requirements or energy needs out of the daily things that you have to do, then you can use those for things that you can do later on that are fun. And then I was laughing at myself because I, I see I wrote heavy absorbent robe on here, and um, I don't think anybody wants to bring anything heavy when they're packing. So really, an absorbent robe can go a long way um, when you step out of the shower or bath or the hot tub. You can put that on and you don't have to to spend the time and the energy drying off. So it's little tiny things like that that add up that can help us with the fatigue management of, of traveling. So the other thing we want to think about in packing is, um, you've probably heard this um, before, but dressing in layers. So especially if you're traveling in an airport, um, bringing layers so that if you get cold, you can, you can put on a layer. If you get too hot, you can take off a layer. It just makes traveling a lot more comfortable. And then packing your essentials first. So I define essentials as something that you can't really easily buy or get your hands on when you get to your destination. So that can be things like medications, cooling devices, um, any mobility assistance that you have. We can strike underwear from that because you can buy that anywhere. But, but those are the things that you really want to make sure you've got packed and then you can pack around that. There are entire catalogs and, and, and a whole industry devoted to wrinkle-free and resistant clothing, and those are fantastic because you can always look your best. Taking a roller suitcase versus a carry-on can save your back and your neck and your energy. And ladies, bring a backpack instead of a purse. Um, the reason for that, if you're like me and you, and you travel by air, um, I pack a lot of stuff in my purse and that makes it heavy. And that can be very fatiguing, especially if it doesn't wear well on your body. Um, so the backpack situates things a little more easily on your body, distributes the weight better, the only note of caution I would give about a backpack is um, they, can, they can easily be accessed by someone who might be pickpocketing you. So making sure that it has a, a locking closure or some way to keep it, keep it safe uh, would be some advice. And then the last piece on this one that I've always heard is pack in advance, let your suitcase sit there for two days, and then remove half of what you've put in there and that's all you need to really travel with. Julian, I love that last piece of advice about waiting two days. That's a great recommendation. What should be considered for packing during travel? Well, packing during tra travel, you want to keep it light, but you also want to have the things that you really, really want to have, especially if you have some delays. Um, and snacks. Um, I don't, cannot tell you how many times I um, have been ravenously hungry in an airport with no time to really grab something to, to eat. So bringing along snacks to keep your, your blood sugar and your energy level going is a great idea. Bringing entertainment. Sometimes when you take public transportation, there are long waits that don't really allow for another um, foray out into the community. So bringing a good book or bringing a movie downloaded or a crossword puzzle is always a good idea. Another thing to make uh, travel, the actual travel piece a lot more comfortable is wearing clothing that's easy to, to manage. So elastic waistband pants, um, slip-on shoes, I'm, I'm predominantly thinking of airline travel, but things that just are not aggravating in any way. You also want to consider your laundry options and pack accordingly. If you have access to laundry facilities, that's great. You don't have to pack as much. And Conventional wisdom, pack an extra set of clothes in a carry-on bag and pack at least two days' worth of medications just in the event that a plane, train, and an automobile sorts of things happens to you. So now we are planned, we're packed, we're prepared. Now what? 
Now what? Now we have to decide what mode of transportation meets your needs, your schedule, your interests. Does this mean you are someone who enjoys traveling and you enjoy the adventure like these two gentlemen? Or are you someone who just wants to get there, get there efficiently, and enjoy your trip? So these questions can help you select the type of transportation that will work best for you, whether that's an airplane, a car, an RV even, perhaps a train, a bus, or maybe even a boat. So let's first talk about air travel. So the first, before you arrive at the airport, we highly recommend that you request wheelchair assistance when booking a flight and also when checking in. Um, and I would just obsessively remind the, air, the airline that you want to use a wheelchair. Be specific if it's a power wheelchair or if it's a manual wheel wheelchair, and indicate that you will also need it at any connecting destinations that you may have. I would also encourage you to take Julianne's advice and carry on in your carry-on luggage. Make sure you have extra change of clothes, medications, any mobility equipment um, that you might need. But please also remember that um, mobility equipment are not included as part of your carry-on luggage. In other words, it's not part of the the one piece that you can think you can carry on. So it, you will not be charged a fee as you are often with some some airlines. And lastly, um, request an aisle seat, and this will help with ease of bathroom access. And that's important for all of us at times. Right on. So Mandy, what are the laws protecting travelers with mobility challenges? This is a great question. There is some history with this. So the Air Carrier Access Act was developed and as a law by the Department of Transportation back in 1986. And basically what it does is it prevents discrimination of people with disabilities in all aspects of air travel. It makes certain that they cannot be refused um, transportation, terminal use, or even air travel access, as well as limiting the number of people with disabilities on a particular flight. However, I, that being said, it is important to note that the Federal Aviation Association or a particular airline can refuse based on safety but they must give you a written explanation for that. Wow. So what is a medical certificate? This is a great question. A medical certificate is a document that essentially declares you fit to fly. So if you are someone with um, particular mobility challenges, they may ask for you to declare that and have a doctor authorize your um, ability to, to travel before your flight. This is not necessarily um, required, but it may depend on the airline. So I would contact your airline about that. Wow. So what does an advance notice involve? An advance notice is uh, just lets the airline know that you are an individual with some mobility limitations or with some type of, of disability and that you intend to travel with their airline. Again, not required, but often airlines do, do request this. So again, it depends on the airline. It can range from anywhere of 48 hours notice or one hour notice prior to arrival. But that being said, I would also recommend that people just give, give two hours prior to departure regardless, give them notice. Let's chat a little bit more about this Air Carrier Access Act because it is, it is important. And I'll so specifically what, go into safety assistance. Julianne, are you familiar with safety assistance? I am not. I'm not either. Well, I am now, but I wasn't prior to this, I should say. Safety assistance are used in situations where passengers are um, maybe determined unable to evacuate safely without some form of assistance. So this can be a person from the airline. It can be a private person, like a friend or a companion. But in that situation, that you would have to, you would be required to pay for that companion. Um, but I would just also keep into and keep into consideration that you, if you need um, any additional space, you may be charged for that. Oh, uh, okay. So if you if you need extra equipment to fly safely, can the airlines charge you or limit you in some way? Great question. Kind of. Like if you need extra space, they can charge you if you need a companion to fly with you. However, 
the baggage limits do not necessarily apply to mobility equipment. Additionally, you cannot be required to sign a waiver that makes the airline exempt from responsibility for any damage to any of your wheelchairs or your scooter or any type of your mobility equipment. Um, however, they will compensate you based on the original purchase price, not on any um, accommodations that you have or upgrades you may have made to your mobility equipment. But I would, we'll talk this, about this a little bit later, but I think it's important to, to note that there are organizations, and one of them is scootaround.com, that does provide repairs to damage wheelchairs in the situation that you're in an airport and someone breaks your, <laughs> breaks your wheelchair. Now, as far as the restrooms go, air carriers must inform travelers if there is an accessible restroom. Now here's the catch. There are no standards for what defines an accessible restroom by the airline industry, so that's highly variable. Oy. So you would advise to get specific details about the bathroom before you fly, right? Without a doubt, absolutely. And when you confirm the bathrooms, certainly confirm that all of the seats have movable armrests, and that means that when, you need, when Mother Nature calls, you can get there on time. <laughs> So now that we've spoken about general airplane guidelines, um, let's make our way through the airport. What about checking in? Great question. Okay, so when you enter the airport, the entire airport, because of that Air Carrier Act that we talked about, should be accessible. Now, that does not include the kiosks, which is where you generally uh, check in. Um, usually that's independently done with a computer type system. Now, if someone has had a different, ex different experience, please certainly uh, chime, in, chime in with the chat, but as of now, most kiosks are not accessible. Um, now, although the airport is accessible, I would expect a long and <laughs> long, long walk, and I would encourage you not to waste valuable energy navigating through the gates and through security and around families and through the food court and the shopping areas um, when you can save that energy for, for your trip. So once you've checked in, usually the next stop, if it's not the restroom, it is TSA, or Transportation Security Administration. And I hope you all can read this cartoon because it says um, airport security. This also known as airport security. I'm not sure if our new public relations slogan is working, TSA, we feel for you. So, TSA has been a source of delay and frustration for many people, but the object is to keep all of us safe when we're flying. Oh boy. So what is all of this? What do we have here? That looks kind of intimidating to me. It, it can be intimidating without a doubt. There are, there are three basic modes of security inspection. This first one on the upper left-hand corner is your x-ray imaging. This one started in, I believe, about 2007. It's, it makes an image of the passenger that's briefly on a screen, but then it's deleted if the passenger is deemed safe and, and able to fly. The upper right corner is a traditional pat-down by a security professional. And then the lower photo that you see is a metal detector, which is common, which you would see um, at other facilities other than just an airport. So how do you know? I mean, I know when I go through security, I don't know what to expect uh, in terms of what I'm going to get for security. How, do, how do, can you guess or how can you know? Great question. I think that's, that's quite a challenge because you never really know what you're going to get sometimes when you pass through security. So transportation, Security Administration recommends calling this TSA CARES, which the phone number is on the screen. And you can ask to describe the process for the anticipated medical conditions. So if, for example, you have difficulty walking or difficulty standing, they will describe to you what that process may entail. Similarly, you could also go to the TSA.gov uh, website, and that would describe a similar a similar uh, process that you would go through at a security checkpoint. Ah. So then who is the passenger support specialist? So a passenger support spe specialist is a person who is 
at the airport who is a TSA representative who just has some additional disability training who, um, whose primary goal is to just make your experience respectful, quick, and efficient. That sounds good. <laughs> so what should an individual expect if when you're walking or standing is limited or just someone who uses a wheelchair or scooter for mobility predominantly? Great question. So, so the standing or walking limitation actually dictates what mode of screening you will go through. So in order to be able to pass through the x-ray technology, the imaging technology, you need to be able to stand for five to seven seconds with your arms over your head. In order to be able to walk through a metal detector, you have to be able to do this without a mobility aid. Otherwise, both of those options automatically default you to a seated or standing pat-down inspection by a security instructor. Um, excuse me, in security inspector. Now, if you can neither stand or walk, you'll be screened while seated by a pat-down. If you are able to stand but aren't able to stand with those specific parameters, then you can just stand near your wheelchair or your scooter, and you'll be screened through a pat-down in that situation. Okay. Oh, is there anything else that we should expect when passing through security? You would think there wouldn't be anything else, but there actually <laughs> is. Um, it may start to sound a little bit like a Transportation Scary Administration <laughs> to some people. So your assisted devices, that meaning your wheelchair, your scooter, your walker, your cane, whatever you might be carrying with you are always examined much, much further. If they're able to pass through the x-ray machine, they will just to ensure that you don't have any explosive or any other prohibited, prohibited items. As far as medications are carrying on fluids greater than 3.4 ounces, so if you have medications, you have syringes, you have ice packs, that, if it can, goes through the x-ray machine. Um, and if it's not able, then it's usually screened separately by a uh, person from TSA. And they won't touch your, your things. They'll just, they'll just screen them and usually um, brush them with different types of chemicals to make sure there are no um, explosives on them. But generally, if you're traveling, you don't have any medications that exceed that 3.4 ounces. You can just carry them in, the, in, in a one-quart, in a single one-quart bag, and, and that should be fine just to pass through an x-ray machine. But at any time, just keep in mind, you guys, that you are able to request a private screening if you're feeling like this is just too much and very uncomfortable for you. Mm -hmm. So what is a disability notification card? A disability notification card is just another way that you can communicate with the TSA representatives about your condition, your mobility limitations, or your specific disability. It just allows you the opportunity to more discreetly, discreetly communicate with them. And you can get that off of the tsa.gov website if you just um, search that disability notification card. Oh, okay. So once you're through security, phew, <laughs> it's probably best, and we certainly recommend, for people to use some sort of wheeled mobility so that you can conserve your energy. What if, if you don't normally have that with you, what are their options and, and what should people consider? Great question. We do encourage people to generally bring their own personal wheelchair if possible. Um, and if you do decide to bring your own personal wheelchair or power mobility or scooter, we encourage people to gate check that, which means you are able to use it throughout the airport and then once you get to the airport or get to the gate, then you, you forfeit your, your mobility aid. And this is the alternative to that is checking it in immediately when you um, check in at the entrance to the airport. So if you, you, if you choose to gate check, you use your scooter or your power wheelchair up to the gate, and then after the flight, someone from the staff will um, bring, bring it for you to use on the remainder of your trip. But this does mean that you have to either walk or use an aisle chair to get to your seat on the airplane. Um, overall, I would say my clients who fly, this has been, this has been the better experience for them. Um, there's a lesser chance of property damage when they gate check their mobility aids. However, we do recommend to remove all accessories. 
So that means take your leg rests, your baskets, your bags, any seat cushions, any fancy cool devices that you have on your wheelchair, take them off and th because there's a lesser chance of them being damaged. Um, and as far as the battery goes, and you'll have to talk to a, a wheelchair vendor about the specifics of this, but I wanted to communicate the concept. Gel cell or dry cell batteries are recommended. I would recommend uh, avoiding wet cell batteries, like the ones are, that are used in automobiles, um, since the airplane will probably have to separate that from, from your device. And that could just, again, pose issue for damage and, and, more, and more challenges. Um, we encourage you to uh, remove the joystick and just put it in your carry-on luggage and walk on the plane with it. It would be easier and, again, minimize the chance of, of damage. But anytime you do forfeit your, your mobility aid, keep in mind, guys, that you're going to have to potentially have to walk or use another, uh, another device for, for mobility. So practice with, your wheel, uh, practice with your physical therapist and get a sense of the distances that you may be required to walk or travel. That's good advice. So now that we're through security and through the terminal, it's on to the plane. So Mandy, what should we know specifically about our plane? Knowing your plane is actually quite helpful. So airplanes after 1992 generally will have movable armrests if there are more than 30 seats, which I'm from Nebraska, and even in Nebraska, <laughs> <laughs> we have generally more than 30 seats. So most of the places that you will be traveling will hopefully have movable armrests. Um, as far as accessible laboratories or accessible restrooms, airplanes with greater than one aisle must have an accessible laboratory. But if it's, if it's only one aisle, then that's optional. So I would definitely um, contact your airline to get that clarification. And also consider the walking distances once you're on the airplane. So the distance from your seat to the restroom and back. And again, practice that with your physical therapist and consider those energy demands as, as part of the, the big picture with your traveling. Now, there are onboard wheelchairs to help with mobility once you're on the airplane. Um, otherwise, you can bring a, like a, a collapsible fold-up wheelchair and put it in a storage space. However, that can be limited, and it depends on the plane how much space they have. Again, just identify your needs to the airline, usually within 24 hours or more, and you may be able to, um, they may be able to accommodate you. So I've been on an airplane before. What do the aisle chairs or the onboard wheelchairs look like? I'm going to guess they're pretty, pretty cozy. They are cozy indeed. They are very narrow. And as you can see on the slide, can you see how, how narrow they truly are? If they're the width of the aisle, maybe slightly less. We're looking at 17 inches is the, the average um, width of an aisle. So it is, you got a suck and tuck, guys. We got a suck and tuck because it's, it's a tight squeeze. Um, and it's also tight once you get into your seat. So there are some average seat dimensions um, on the screen. However, if you want to know what your specific seat dimensions are on your airplane, I would recommend going to SeatGuru.com, and they will give you the specifics. And then you can use those dimensions to practice with your PT or your OT, um, how to transfer and how to maneuver in um, confined spaces in preparation for your, for your trip. If there was ever a case for flying first class, <laughs> so it's a it's a tight squeeze in the seat as as a, as we all find out. What are the bathrooms like? The bathrooms, as you can imagine, are also quite snug. Again, m most airplanes will have an accessible laboratory, but the definition of accessible is highly variable. And actually, there are some organizations that are addressing that discrepancy. But I put up some averages on the screen of, of the dimensions from the front of the toilet to the sides of the door and the doorways. But just keep in mind, they all will accommodate an onboard wheelchair. So just, just ask your airline if they can give you the measurements, the parameters, give you an indication of where the grab bars might be on the type of airplane that you're going to be on. 
if there are grab bars, that type of thing. To, again, so you have the opportunity to practice with your PT or your OT how to most efficiently um, turn and transfer. That's good advice. Um, is the airline expected to help you in the bathroom? That's a really great question. So the airline it must provide assistance as you need for food, if you need help cutting things. Um, they have to provide you assistance to and from the restroom. So this means if you need to use an aisle chair. However, they are not required to help you once you're in the bathroom. So you need to be independent with those toileting activities. So you're on the plane. I hope you enjoy your flight. If you guys can read this, uh, this cartoon, it says, First place, longest sustained crying competition. Hopefully, your seat will not be placed next to this. Your snug and cozy seat will not be placed to this young couple. <laughs> and many times, <laughs> many times it has been. So now we are on to car travel. And um, there are many advantages to car travel, one of them being it isn't air travel. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Air travel can be great. <laughs> um, if you're driving your own car, the obvious is is right there. It's your own car. You have it fitted with your own creature comforts. Um, if you do use hand controls or any other adaptations, you know all about them, and they're they're exactly as you want them. Um, not the least of which that makes car travel so appealing is adjusting your own schedule. It's your own schedule. And you can adjust it to your own daily needs. You can stop to eat when you want to. You can stop to gawk when you want to, um, notwithstanding all the other kinds of stops we all need to make. There are no luggage restrictions and no extra fees and no surprises. And not the least of which, if you're, well, as you can probably tell, I'm a bit biased. Um, I enjoy car travel. I like a good road trip. You can enjoy the sights along the way, and really you can make that uh, very much a, very, a part of your own vacation. Um, and you can enjoy it in a flexible way and with the ease that, that, that you would like. Julianne, I would travel with you any day, but what are some <laughs> disadvantages to car travel? Well, there are disadvantages, and as you all can see, um, breaking down would probably be chief among them. Um, in that regard then, because it can be stressful not only to break down, but it can be stressful to, to know, well, where on, where on earth do you take your car to a reliable mechanic when you've never been in this town before? Uh, so AAA in insurance is always a good idea, I think, um, to give you some peace of mind there. But you want to take into consideration that driving can be stressful. It's a lot of sitting. It's, it's a lot of time, depending upon where you're going. Um, and you want to do what we do also recommend for any other kind of travel when you're sitting and your mobility is, is limited and you're sitting for long periods of time. Take a break and change your position at least once an hour, more if you can, but at least once an hour you know, stop and get out and stretch and walk around and restore all the blood flow to your extremities. Um, and then the other thing to consider is the extra time that it could possibly take you, um, especially if you're driving through major cities. Uh, you might want to time your trip through major cities so that you're not hitting uh, rush hour traffic and therefore sitting in, in the lovely exhaust fumes that we've all been there, I'm sure. <laughs> Julianne, what about a rental car? Are there any options for rental vehicles? You know, there really are. And, and as we were... Um, preparing for this webinar, I was a bit surprised at how many options are out there. And uh, most major rental car companies do have options to make a car accessible. Uh, again, just like the hotel rooms, it's a great idea to call and find out exactly what you're getting and to, to voice exactly what you need to the car company so that when you get to your destination um, or when you go to pick up your car, you're not surprised um, by something not being quite right for you. But they have, they offer hand controls, steering wheel knobs, and wheelchair ramps. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite a good option. What about the home away from home? What about those RVs? Tell us about those. <laughs> right. And uh, 
So now you'll hear another, another enthusiastic report from me. I'm a big fan of RVs. Um, the, there's a lot of advantages to them. There's no hotel expenses. But often, uh, especially if you stay in some of the nicer campsites, there are campsite fees. And they can range from anywhere from $25 a night to $50 to $75 a night, depending upon how posh your campsite is. But you know, the obvious benefit is you can make your own schedule again. You can have a picnic lunch wherever you want, right there in your RV. Um, so that makes that very easy. Um, there are great, when you get to camp, to the campsites, the campsites are really low key and relaxed. And people generally are really quite friendly. They're willing to give you a, a helping hand. Um, and there's surprise, surprise, surprise to me, there's some really great socialization opportunities. Um, some of the campsites offer like rock hounding trips, or they offer a card night. Some offer like dancing, square dancing. Some of them have uh, you know, like photography shares. So there's, it, it really has surprised me that there are quite a few socialization options. And if you are towing, either towing a car behind an RV or you are towing an RV, um, you can detach and drive a smaller vehicle for exploration into towns, which can also be fun. This sounds nearly perfect, but certainly there has to be some, some drawback. Ah, uh, yes, in the yin and the yang of our world, <laughs> there are. Uh, disadvantages would, would the, the, the first and foremost one would be whoever is driving needs to feel comfortable driving a very large vehicle. And last summer I drove a very large RV for my parents and found that I really can drive just about anything. <laughs> but whoever is driving needs to be, to be comfortable with that. The cost of fuel can be a drawback because they're, they're huge gas guzzlers. And the other part of this to consider that when you get to your campsite, in order to set up or take down your campsite does require a moderate amount of physical activity. Um, even when these RVs are equipped with automatic ramps and automatic stabilizer jacks and automatic awnings, um, Murphy does travel by RV. And invariably you have to get out and, hey, is that one stabilizer jack down? And, so there's a, there's a fair amount of, of, of working around the vehicle and setting up your camp. So that's something to consider that might be a disadvantage. So there must be accessible features for RVs, right? So what would they be? Uh, there are definitely um, accessible um, – oops, I'm going to flip back one more. Um, there are accessible – RVs, and they have a lot of the same features that, that we suggest and, and have for people in their homes. Um, and that can be stairs and ramps. Um, the thing that I want to talk about on this slide before I go more specifically into the accessible features, um, campsites will often have uh, good bathhouses. So if for some reason uh, the bath breaks in your RV or the shower stops working or something, um, you can go into some of the bathhouses there. You just have to figure how much distance are you walking um, or having to mobilize, and um, how do you carry your, your toiletries and your clothing, your change of clothing for that. So that's something to, to think about as well. So longer faucet handles, conveniently located controls, lighting can be brighter, uh, entrances are wider, Sinks can be roll under and showers can be roll in in terms of accessible RV features. And you just take those wherever you go. So it can be very, very nice. So that pretty much sums up an RV. Let's talk a bit about train travel. Mandy, tell us a little bit about the Amtrak option. So when you first contact Amtrak, you can go on Amtrak.com or you can call them online to find the telephone number that's on the screen to go ahead and uh, request a ticket. Um, if you wish to have some accessibility options, you need to articulate that when you make your reservation. Um, so you would have to dictate if you need a wheelchair space, an accessible transfer seat, or an accessible bedroom. And an accessible transfer seat is a seat that you are in when your wheelchair is stowed. Oh, okay. And once 
you have made your travel reservations, you can also request an accessible bedroom if your trip is that long. And we generally recommend that our, our Amtrak rather recommends that you request this within 14 days prior to your departure. Um, and this is generally reserved for passengers with reduced mobility, and you must certify this need or you must validate this need for accommodations with the conductor on that given day as well. Um, additionally, a 15% discount, which is really awesome, is provided to passengers with mobility limitations and their travel companions, one travel companion. Huh, so that, that discount is pretty nice. Um, does that mean there's no assistance provided by the staff if, if it's needed? That is correct. So a passenger with um, any type of mobility limita limitations traveling alone on Amtrak should be independent with or without mobility aids. And again, um, just provide that written documentation of, of your mobility limitations, and there are some sources for where you can get that documentation at. Uh -huh. So Amtrak sounds pretty friendly for individuals with uh, physical challenges. Um, how are the stations? Are they accessible? They are variable. The accessibility is variable. So we recommend contacting Amtrak.com or again using the telephone number to find out the accessibility of your particular station. And also recommend at that time if you are going to need, or also inform them rather, at that time if you are going to need any assistance um, while, on the, while on board. Um, arriving one hour early prior to your departure is also recommended, particularly if you need um, any type of assistance on site. And as far as aids go, Amtrak is not required and will not provide any assistance, as we mentioned when, earlier, to travelers with mobility issues once you are on board. And if you are unable, you may be asked to, to deboard the, the, the train. And again, it just reinforces that you can bring that travel companion because, again, you get that 15% 15, 15 discount. Hmm. Well, that is interesting. So, so that varies quite a bit from plane travel. Um, with airplane travel, they are willing and required to aid you as necessary. You got it. So if you want some assistance, you may want to consider, consider airplane travel. Mm -hmm. So now that we are on the train, what does the interior look like? Great question. So before we get on the train, I'm just going to quickly show you uh, the variations for how you can board. You can board by a lift, a gap, um, like a bridge gap with a plate, or even just a ramp. It just depends. And again, contact, contact your, um, air pra your Amtrak rather, um, boarding station to get a sense of what they might be. But the interior, Here's a picture of the interior to answer your question, Julianne. Um, the interior is actually quite comfortable. It um, may the, oh, let me just explain what these two pictures are. The, the upper left-hand corner is an image of the coach interior, and the upper right-hand corner is an image of the first class interior. And just as an additional additional toot your horn for the first class, meals are served seat side in first class. Well, that would and be really next, nice. <laughs> yeah. The next slide gives you some um, specific dimensions. I'm sorry, the following slide after this will give you some specific dimensions. Here is an image of the accessible bathrooms and bedrooms. So obviously on the left is the, the bathroom and the bedroom is a person with, uh, who needs some mobility assistance and then their travel companion on the, the upper berth. So in the next slide it gives you some specifics as far as the dimensions and the parameters of the accessible bedrooms. And I can let you, let you guys read through those. But I think what's important in the take-home message from this again is use this information Take it back to your physical therapist. Take it back to your occupational therapist and, and have them practice with you how to transfer and how, them, how to um, transfer efficiently in these smaller spaces. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, a major part of being prepared, especially if you confront something that you're not, you're not used to doing all the time. Exactly, exactly. 
And on the next slide we talk a little bit more for wheelchair users. Uh, you can use your power wheelchair. You can use your manual wheelchair. You can even use a walker on the train. But you, you should be aware that there is no um, locks or tie downs available. So in that situation you may be required to transfer to a, a chair on the, on the train as well. Um, and I just want to comment too, most of the time a walker should be able to work on an Amtrak aisle, but that doesn't isn't exclusive. So again, contract the, contact the Amtrak station and find out what specific type of train you're using to make sure those other mobility aids that you might use are included on there. All right, are there any specific luggage requirements with Amtrak? Great question. So there are some luggage requirements. I wouldn't say they're quite as, as stingy as the, uh, the airplane, but uh, two bags carry on, four bags checked luggage. Two are free when you check them, otherwise additional $20 per bag. Um, again, medications and medically necessary items similar to an airplane do not count towards that limit of carry-on luggage. And again, scooters, wheelchairs, walkers, canes, anything else that you might need are, are also not included. Okay, now that we've covered trains, planes, cars, RVs, let's briefly talk about boats, cruises, and buses. Go ahead, Julianne. Right on. So cruises can be just absolutely fantastic. Um, some of the things that you want to consider uh, when, you, when you consider a boat or a cruise um, is how close you are to a port of departure. Uh, so obviously it's going to take some amount of travel uh, unless you live right on the coast, to get to that. So you want to, to, to factor that in in terms of packing and energy requirements and things like that. Um, but boy, I tell you, it's a, it's a floating hotel, and you've got everything you need, meals, activities, entertainment, masseuses, manicurists, pedicurists, uh, everything you could possibly imagine um, on those cruises. And, and most of it is really very, um, very good. In terms of seasickness, and everybody is, is, uh, can be very different. Um, what I've generally um, understood from people who take cruises and then from taking them myself is the larger boats, the really big cruise ships, um, don't tend to make people as seasick unless you happen to run into bad weather. Um, but the smaller boats, um, if you tend towards seasickness, you definitely want to consult with your doctor before you go to get some options um, for that. Nevertheless, if you tend towards seasickness, um, talking with your doctor before you go would be a great idea to have some, some options um, open for you. There are a couple of websites that are excellent to hit here, uh, the Cruise Critic and the Disability Travel, so I'd recommend looking at those. Um, and most cruise lines have handicapped accessible rooms, so that's uh, something that, that is uh, rather easy to, to gain. In terms of bus travel, um, this is probably one of the, the more challenging ones of the ones that we've discussed here. Um, quite simply because um, the, the mobility issues can be a bit more challenging. Um, fatigue can also be a bigger factor just because there's not um, as many breaks necessarily um, available to you. And when there are bathroom breaks, um, they tend to be limited because they're on a schedule. So there's just a little bit less freedom, I think, with that. But nevertheless, it can be a, a great way to go. Um, a lot of people will, will join chartered buses. And um, if you have individuals on the bus who have uh, similar needs to yours, then you can kind of dictate the schedule or the pace of the activities might be uh, better suited to you. So Disabled Travelers is a good website to hit for that. Keep in mind that uh, sometimes on those charter buses, um, walkers or wheelchairs or scooters cannot go on the bus with you, and they have to be stored underneath. And so you have to wait for those to come out and, and be able to get to those. So those are some of the things to um, think about in terms of um, cruises and buses. And certainly we can take any questions here upcoming. Um, so general tips for travel, for all travel, whether it's planes, trains, automobiles, cars, RVs, um, it's a good idea to have a note 
from your MD stating that you have MS and then having all the contact information um, about your MD on that note. Um, it, it might be a good idea to have on that note devices and medications that you typically use. Um, certainly if you're flying, you want to label those things in bags just to limit the amount of questions that TSA would end up having. But mentioning cooling devices and what they do, um, what the canes are, um, injectable medications, that can all just smooth things over and make it a lot easier to travel. Pacing yourself is absolutely essential. And that takes, that, that's one of the reasons we recommended the, uh, the shorter trips first, is just to get a good feel for when you need to rest and, and when your energy is best when you're traveling. We all know that when you get away from home and you get away from your routine, uh, it changes your energy level and your energy requirements. So learning how to pace yourself is great. I would even recommend if you're going to go on a bigger trip, to, to maybe sit down with your occupational therapist and talk about pacing um, or brush up on some of the fatigue management um, information that's out there through the National MS Society or by Can Do or, or some of the local sources. I can't really say enough about cooling vests because they can really save your energy. If, if you become overheated, um, sometimes that just means game over. And, and that's a real uh, bummer um, to have to, to call game over when you're right in the middle of something that you're interested in. So the thing I want you to know about cooling vests is that uh, the evaporative cooling vests work best in a drier environment like the desert. Um, they don't work quite as well in um, a humid environment. So researching what kind of a cooling vest or cooling devices uh, work best in what climates is a good idea. And then know what your insurance is going to do if you are abroad or if you are traveling. Um, just in the unfortunate event of an exacerbation, that's stressful enough. It's a good idea to know um, what your insurance can and, and is willing to do for you. There are many resources for mobility equipment rentals. I was surprised by this when we started researching this. Scootaround.com is a great place to hit. They're nationwide. They deliver uh, mobility to, to the cruise port, to hotels, to residences. Um, the average weekly cost of renting, say, a power wheelchair is $225. For a scooter, it's $200. Um, and we recommend that you take those collapsible fold-up canes um, so they can fit easily within your carry-on luggage. Resources uh, for mobility equipment rentals is able to travel um, accessible vacations and business travel, equipment rentals, it kind of goes through the whole gamut there. And special needs at sea is another great website to hit. And then ground transportation, wheelchair getaways, um, rents uh, vans, uh, wheelchair accessible vans. And the cost is 80 to approximately $140 a day depending upon what kind of a van you want to get. It's worth looking into whether your insurance will cover the cost of an accessible rental vehicle for you. Um, so those can um, be, can be a, a, a saver, a, a, nice, a nice lanyard for your uh, travel. So Mandy, back to you. So kind of in summary, I hope you guys have gained some valuable information from our conversation tonight. Um, but the take home message is planning for travel generally equals success with travel considering where, how, what you might need for the successful travel are, are what will encourage and promote success with travel, but taking in those, to those considerations. And we just generally encourage you to anticipate those unexpected adventures that come along with travel, and overall just enjoy, enjoy the journey and enjoy the opportunity to get to see and have a small adventure. Some references we would encourage you guys to look at if you're looking into travel. And lastly, any questions, comments that we can entertain? Otherwise, bon voyage. Have a great trip. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Mandy and Julianne. Um, there actually were quite a few comments through our chats of how um, useful and valuable all this information is. And, um, and to answer a few, of your, a few of your questions, yes, you will receive a PDF of all of tonight's slides so that you can um, 
ac access all of the valuable links and um, and resources that are provided in this, in this presentation. So no worries, you will get that this evening after tonight's webinar. Um, we did get a few questions, and um, quite a few questions on international travel. Um, so if, if, if you do have answers to these, one of our questions is, um, you know, if, if the procedures in airports or security procedures in, in airports in, in Europe are similar or you know where they could possibly go about finding more information about handicap accessibility and security in the airports in Europe? Um, I'll go ahead and try to tackle this question. I did not research international travel specifically, and this is Mandy. So if um, we'll, we'll definitely take that into consideration in an upcoming webinar when we do this. Um, but what I would encourage you to do, if you can like contact the current, like I would contact tsa.gov, or call that TSA website, and then ask them to contact with you, put you in contact with the security administration of the country that you are going to be traveling to, and I, hopefully that would would guide you in the right direction. Julianne, do you have any comments or experience? Yeah, I would not necessarily experience per se, but um, I would I would get with a travel agent mm -hmm. and uh, someone who's versed in that and and have them either do some of the, talk, the calling ahead for you, or they may already have information um, about that. Um, I guess one other thing I would add, in, in Europe, when traveling, Europe definitely has so much better public transportation than the States does, well, in the Western United States, I should say. And um, you can have a, a fair amount of waiting time, waiting for the next um, conveyance to come along. So having something that um, to entertain you or to take your time or, or planning a way to, to work in a rest break is, is really helpful when you're traveling in Europe. Great. Thank you. We all love Europe. <laughs> I'd love right on. <laughs> um, we have another question, and maybe um, this would be good for Julianne. The, uh, they're asking what's the best way um, to cool down when visiting somewhere that they weren't expecting it to be hot. Um, ah. so if, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are all kinds of, of ways to get around that without actually having like a cooling vest or something. Um, and, and you can really run the gamut. Um, certainly something as simple as having a great big floppy sun hat. Um, and then you can wet, um, depending upon how, how how you are about your hair, um, you can wet a, 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 like a handkerchief and put that on your head and then put the sun hat over the top of that. Um, head, feet, and wrists are great places to cool to really get that the blood vessels are closest to our skin there. And so what, the cooling has a greater effect uh, or a greater immediate effect there. Um, I cannot underestimate the power of a good icy or a slurpee that can cool you down really fast from, from the core and out. Um, so I would say a cool neckerchief around your neck or your head or your wrists are good ways to do it. I've also recommended in the past um, going to Walmart and getting a fishing vest and some cooling packs, those gel packs, and put those in the pockets, and they can be right up against your body, and, and that can help to cool you. Great. That sounds refreshing. Um, yeah, I, it does. Mandy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think those are great recommendations. I was actually writing them down, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually had another question about um, keeping things cool, um, about medications. So if they're traveling with their medications and they need to be cool, is there a way to keep them cool without um, you know, the use of a refrigerator if they don't have one or if they don't have a fridge nearby that they can use? Right. Um, cool. So, so having a, a small cooler um, can can go a long way to helping helping with that. Um, I don't know, Mandy. Maybe you know how long the medications can can hold their the you know how long they can go without without being refrigerated. So if that's a matter of a couple of hours, irregardless, probably if you're flying, you need to find a way to keep them cooler and a uh, you know. There's little lunch bags that they make that are insulated, and you can put a gel pack in there, and that really should be sufficient you know, for up to six hours, six to eight hours, I would think. I would agree. And to actually um, echo, I would um, encourage 
folks to go to um, like breastfeeding websites and resources, and I know that sounds a bit bizarre, <laughs> yeah. have um, smaller cooling packs and um, firm cold ice packs that last up to about 12 hours keeping, keeping um, milk cool for breastfeeding mothers. So that's a great alternative to, um, and it's very compact as well. So that'd be another alternative to keeping your medicine cool for a long period of time without access to a refrigerator. Excellent. That's a good That's idea. Really smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and we have another question here about the leg lifter. I think that you guys had mentioned before. They're asking what exactly is a leg lifter, as they've been using a dog leash. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, because the thing I was going to say is, it looks like an invisible dog leash. <laughs> and and I commend I commend your your ingenuity. Um, a leg lifter does, in fact, look like a dog leash. The the thing that makes it a little easier to deal with is that it's a little bit more rigid, um, and so therefore it's a little easier. They have a, a floppy end, and then there's a, an, an end that's like it's got a coat hanger in it, kind of idea. So you can you can enlarge or reduce the size of the loop on the end, and then it's made out of a really durable, uh, strong um, uh, plastic. Um, like a woven plastic, the name is escaping me, nylon, thank you, nylon. And so it's a, it's a pretty rigid tool altogether. So it can, it can make, make li uh, lifting your legs up a little easier because the tool is a little more rigid. I think there's a picture back in there. Excellent. I'm not sure. Maybe that was a reacher. Excellent. Um, yeah, and we can start, we'll send those slides and they'll have access to those to, to see those mm -hmm. pictures. Um, and then one final question, and um, they're asking if they're, where they can go to rent mobility de devices in the destination they're going to, and if that's possible, whether they can rent a device um, or their mobility device at the airport or, um, you know, in the city that they're traveling to. Julianne, I can take this one. The scootaround.com. I believe does that, like they can deliver it to wherever, whatever site you need it to, to be delivered to. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Um, so I think that is the, all the time that we have um, for questions, but again, please um, feel free to um, email me directly your questions if you have any. Um, you can also email them to our Ask the Can Do team um, portal. Um, it's our portal on our website. It's one of our resources where you can just, you know, enter your question in and um, one of your one of our programs consultants on our staff will receive your question and can answer it for you. Um, so feel free to, you know, if your questions weren't answered to answer to go ahead and and ask your questions on the site. Um, and just a few other resources that we have. Um, we do have a library of articles that are written by our um, very well-versed uh, programs consultants, and that can be found on our website. And there's articles on all sorts of different topics um, that you can sort through. And we also have our e-news, which is a monthly newsletter that we send out electronically to everyone in our database, and it's also housed on our website. So you can learn about all of our upcoming events and, and just what Can Do MS is up to for that month. So again, everyone, thank you for um, joining us this evening. And um, our next month's webinar on July 8th, it will be at um, the same time. Um, and the topic is Unique Approaches to Unique MS Symptoms. And this is a two-part series. Um, and the second part will be in September. Uh, but join us for the first one on Unique Approaches to Unique MS Symptoms with our physical therapist, Patty Bobrick, and our physician assistant, Amy Dix. And you can register online. Um, on our website. And uh, thank you again, uh, Mandy and Julian, for all of your helpful tips and um, for everyone joining us. And we look forward to, uh, to meeting with you again next time. Thanks again.